the last video, we talked a little bit about how nanograv will be able to detect pairs of supermassive black holes that are in orbit around each other. But before discussing what we will be able to learn about black holes, we should talk a little bit about what exactly black holes are. And a lot of you have probably watched science fiction movies or read science fiction books that talk about black holes, and there are a number of common misconceptions regarding exactly what they are and what they do. So in this video and in the next video, we're going to try to clarify some of these common misconceptions. Now to do this, we're going to first need to review a few concepts from special and general relativity, but I'm going to try to keep these parts brief and we'll get onto the specific properties of black holes pretty quickly. So to help show us what black holes are, we're going to use space-time diagrams. And these diagrams help us visualize how objects move through space and how objects move through time. So for example, if I were just standing still in this particular reference frame, my space-time trajectory is going to look something like this. I'm not moving anywhere in space, but as I sit here, I'm still moving in time. Now, if I have a certain velocity or I'm moving in this reference frame, my trajectory might look something like this. As time goes on, my position in space is going to move, and depending on how fast I'm going, determines how tilted this line is. So here I'm not going very fast, here I'm going a little bit faster. Now, according to special relativity, there is a universal speed limit that nothing can go faster than, and that's specifically the speed of light. So let's say I start out at a certain point in space-time, a certain position in space and a certain moment in time, and I fire beams of light in all directions. Well, I can draw out the trajectories of those beams of light. I could even add in another spatial direction on my graph here. There's space. And you'll see that those beams of light will form a cone shape as they move away from where I started. Now, if nothing can go faster than the speed of light, then this light cone shows me the boundary of the region of space-time that I can send a signal to or interact with in any way if I'm starting from this particular point. So, kind of on the other hand, if I started from this region here, I couldn't reach a point over here because I would have to go faster than the speed of light in order to reach that. So, we cannot do that. So, we refer to this as our future light cone, and it's literally the entire region of space-time that we could possibly go to or influence or affect in any way if we're starting from this point. Now, of course, if we start to move, let's say we take a, a certain trajectory that looks like that, then at a later time, we're going to have a different light cone, but that's just because we've moved and now starting from this point, there's a different region that we could affect in our future. So that's kind of the idea of a future light cone. But what does that have to do with gravity? Well, most of us are used to thinking about gravity as some kind of force that pulls objects together. So for example, the Earth pulls down on us and keeps us attached to the Earth, and the uh, Sun pulls the Earth in its orbit, and that kind of gives us the idea that we were taught in school that gravity is some kind of pulling force. However, Einstein, with his theory of general relativity, found that gravity could be much better described as the effect of very massive objects actually curving the geometry of space-time around them. And this curved space-time changes how objects move and how light propagates. So gravity is not a pulling force, it's better described by this geometric effect. I've heard many people ask the question of why is light affected by gravity since photons, which make up light, are actually massless. And it's true that in the Newtonian view of gravity, massless light shouldn't be affected, but that's one of the areas where this view of gravity as a pulling force actually kind of fails, and the view of gravity as an effect of the geometry of space-time does much better and matches all of our observations. For example, we have this Hubble image, this is one of my favorite Hubble images, of 
a number of large galaxies and these wispy galaxies that are kind of look like they're actually curved. And what's happening here is, let's say we are observing this cluster of galaxies from the Earth, and there are all of these large massive galaxies that are in the foreground of the image, but behind those galaxies are behind these galaxies in the foreground are these galaxies that are in the background and the light from those galaxies is actually affected by the presence of these massive galaxies. These galaxies are curving space-time around them and that has an effect of on the trajectory of light that passes by them. So we can actually see this effect of the curvature of space-time. So what does this look like on our space-time diagram? So let's draw a new space-time diagram and it's going to be uh, a large diagram. So space and time. And let's say on this particular diagram we put a large mass that's just sitting over here. This could be a planet or a star or a black hole or just any mass that's sitting there. Well this mass changes the geometry of the space-time around it. And the light rays that form our light cone are going to continue to follow straight lines but in this curved space-time. Now if I'm far over here then I'm far away from the effect of the of the mass and where this curved space-time is so my light cone is going to look pretty much the same as it did before. However, if we look at a point that is closer to the mass, closer to where the space-time is more strongly curved, then compared to this light cone, the light cone over here is going to be at first very slightly tilted towards the mass. So this light cone is tilted in that direction and as we get closer and closer to the mass that tilt is going to become more and more pronounced. And it's important to remember that there is no gravitational force that is pulling on this light or anything like that. It is the effect of the curvature of space-time. These light paths are still following straight lines in a curved space. And since it is very difficult to draw curved surfaces on a you know flat computer screen, these straight lines, these straight light paths are going to look like they're curved. It's actually very similar to how flight paths look on a map for airlines. If I have a flight going from Los Angeles, California to London, England, that airline flight is going to follow this path that goes over uh, northern Quebec and Greenland. And that looks on this flat map like it's a very curved line. However, if we look at a globe and trace the path from Los Angeles to London, then we see that this actually is a straight line on the curved surface of the Earth. So since we're looking at this with the wrong geometry, these straight lines are going to appear curved. The exact same thing is happening with our space-time diagram. These light rays are following straight lines in a curved space-time. But since we can't truly draw a curved space-time, they look like the light is actually being curved. This not only affects light, but the curvature of space-time also affects the trajectories of massive objects in everyday situations. When you throw a baseball and watch it go up and down, it's actually following a straight line in a curved space-time. The mass of the Earth has curved the space-time on the surface of the Earth in such a way that it will affect the trajectory of that thrown object. It's not being pulled on by a gravitational force, but once it's in freefall, it's following a straight line in a curved space-time. So, with this picture, we have large masses curve space-time and as we get closer to the mass our light cones are going to tilt more and more towards the mass. Now if we were for instance approaching the Earth or approaching even a star then we would run into the surface of that object, let's say the surface of the Earth, long before this effect becomes too extreme and if we went and dug inside of the Earth the light cone wouldn't continue to tilt that way because we would have mass on either side. 
However, if we didn't have the Earth, and let's say we had a very small but very dense and massive object that we could keep getting closer and closer to, then we would eventually reach the point where our light cone is tilted enough that what was the side of the light cone that pointed away from the mass is now pointing straight upwards on our diagram. And if we continued even farther, then the light cone would even after that point continue to tilt more and more so the entire light cone would be pointed towards this mass. Now, we said before when we were introducing the idea of a light cone that there is no way that you can reach any points that are outside of your light cone. So once we get to this point where the entire light cone is pointing towards the mass, there is no way that we can get out of this region of space-time once we have entered it. it. doesn't matter how many rocket engines you strap to your spaceship, it doesn't matter what you do, once you enter into this region, you cannot get out. And again, this is purely a result of how this mass had changed the geometry of space-time around it. There's no pulling involved. But this geometry of space-time restricts you from being able to escape this region once you enter it. The boundary of this region, where once you enter this region you cannot escape, the boundary of this region is referred to as the event horizon. And the reason that we call it an event horizon is that if there is some event that happens inside of here, an observer that's far away from the mass and watching cannot see any signals from what happens inside of this event horizon. And again, this is the effect of the curvature of space-time. Space-time is so curved that not even light can escape this region. So this finally gives us a picture of what a black hole is. If we have some mass that has somehow been collapsed or compressed down to such a small size that it's inside of this event horizon, then it turns out that the mass will continue to collapse down to a point of infinite density that we call the singularity. And that's where all of the mass of the black hole is. So our final picture of just what a black hole is, is we have this region uh, that is bounded by the event horizon. And this is the region where if you enter it, you cannot escape. And at the very center of this region, we have the singularity. And that is where all of the mass of the black hole resides. And if you cross the event horizon, if you cross this boundary, then you will be in a region that no matter what you do, your future light cone points towards the singularity. No matter what you do, the singularity is in your future. So that's where all of the mass ends up, including you if you go past the event horizon. So now that we have this picture for a black hole, we can address some of the common misconceptions about the properties of black holes, and we will do this in the next video.